Eh, bienvenidos a un nuevo programa, decíamos ayer, donde hoy tendremos la oportunidad y el honor de entrevistar a Edward Shawcross, eh, un historiador y profesor británico que ha cursado sus estudios en la Universidad de Oxford y el University College de Londres y es doctor por este último. Es especialista en el imperialismo francés eh, en Hispanoamérica y en el Segundo Imperio Mexicano y recientemente autor de esta maravilla de libro que tengo aquí, eh, aquí El Último Emperador de México. So, Edward, thank you for accepting the interview and welcome to Decíamos Ayer. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, the, the short answer is not good. Uh, Mexico, to use a, an acronym, was a failed state by this period and certainly was viewed as such by the European powers. Um, there had been a civil war uh, in the 1850s between two political groups, liberals and conservatives, uh, and they had fought over what they thought should be the future of Mexico, the helpfully named political parties. Um, the conservatives arguing that the Catholic Church is the kind of the rock upon which Mexico is founded and the only thing that ties Mexico together as a nation. The liberals, on the other hand, led by the um, great hero of Mexican history, Benito Juarez, arguing that the Catholic Church power needs to be broken, the state needs to be secularized, and Mexico needs to be dragged, um, kicking and screaming, as it were, into the mid-19th century. Um, and that conflict had followed on from a uh, perhaps even more traumatic one in the 1840s. In 1846, this is the US-Mexican War. Um, which is an absolute disaster for Mexico, um, which loses every battle it, it fights. It, its army is humiliated by the US Expeditionary Force, which marches its way up to, to Mexico City, the same route that Denan Cortez um, took in the 16th century, occupies Mexico City, stars and stripes unfurled across the magnificent main square. And the only way that the US troops will leave is after Mexico signs away nearly half of its national territory. So this is places today like California, um, and part of the United States of America. So you had this trauma and humiliation in this war of foreign aggression from the United States of America, followed by a civil war in the 1850s. The economy um, is, 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 is in a seriously bad way. Uh, state institutions are weak. And although the liberals win that civil war, defeat the conservatives, Mexico is far from politically stable. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, in, 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 in France, you have Napoleon III comes to power in 1848, first as president and then launches a coup d'etat um, against his own government and proclaims himself emperor in 1852. And he subscribes very much to this idea of pan-Latinism, as you say. Uh, and this is, it's, this, this is an idea that had been current in, in Europe for a few decades. The, the French twist on it um, is that the, the southern European countries, as they, as they saw them, so Spain, France, Italy, um, they have a shared history, a shared culture, both um, political and, and religious um, in, in terms of Catholicism. And this was a fairly commonplace uh, idea, as I say, in Europe. But the French twist is that they exported across the Atlantic. So everywhere that was part of the Spanish Empire, uh, so essentially Mexico southwards, is included in, in part of this Latin tradition. And of course, there is shared language and shared religion and, and to some extent shared history. Now, France is the, is the self-appointed leader um, of, of the Pan-Latinist movement, um, as, as in, in mid-19th century, the most powerful country um, uh, of, of these Latin nations. And Louis Napoleon, um, Napoleon III, his great fear, as along with many other Pan-Latinists, is the continued expansion of the United States of America. And Pan-Latinism is always in opposition to what they call the Anglo-Saxon world. Sometimes that includes Britain, sometimes it doesn't. It's slightly confusing, but it's certainly in, in, the, in the Americas includes the United States of America. And so he sees and his advisors see the Latin world in Latin America in retreat to US aggression, and of course, Protestant US aggression. So 
part of the reason why France gets involved is because of this idea of, of Pan-Latinism defending the, the Latin nations, the, the Catholic religion, against what they see as the, the never-ending onslaught of Protestant United States of America. And in fact, the, the word uh, uh, Latin America is first used in, a, in the 1850s, um, and that term has come into, into popular violence. But it's denoted exactly as such, that, that Latin, I mean, there's nothing um, Latin in the sort of Roman sense of, of the Americas, of course, they're using that term Latin to demarcate it as a sphere of, of French interest. Right, well, we have to go even further back in Mexican history uh, into 1821. And that's the year in which Mexico is declared independent after a brutal 11 year struggle for independence against the Spanish Empire. Um, and how Mexico becomes independent is important because unlike all other Latin American nations, apart from uh, Brazil, Mexico becomes independent as a monarchy. Uh, a man called Augustin de Itabide is a Spanish royalist fighting for Spain um, and for the Spanish Empire who switches sides and he's able to unite the various disparate groups in Mexico behind him with a plan and the plan is simple. Mexico will be an empire uh, and this, the word empire here, it purely means a state, a, a monarchy and so it will have an emperor um, and the reason that's important, the reason that can bring over quite a lot of the people who are unsure about independence is because it can be seen as a conservative path to independence. So you have independence, which is, of course, what many people have been fighting for, but you have it within the traditional framework of, of, of what has been going on in Mexico since the Spanish conquest in the 16th century. Now, it's a disaster because um, Itabide, his plan is to offer the, 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 the crown to a, Span to a member of the Spanish royal family, Ferdinand VII refuses point blank to accept anything short of complete reconquest of Mexico. So Itabide is presented with a problem. He has an empire without an emperor. He does what any ambitious general would do in that situation, and he has himself proclaimed emperor. His, his reign is short, nine months um, before he's run out of Mexico and forced into exile. He comes back expecting to be welcomed as a hero. Um, he's not. He's executed for treason and shot. Um, which perhaps could have been a warning for later attempts to impose monarchy on Mexico. But why that's important is because there is this history in, uh, of, of monarchy in Mexico, which increasingly, as the decades go forward to, to the period we're looking at, uh, as Mexico is wracked by political instability, by violence, by the humiliation and trauma of the US invasion, and then by civil war, more and more politicians on the conservative side of Mexican politics begin to argue that where Mexico went wrong was that original moment of, of independence because it should have been a monarchy. And had it been ruled by a European monarch, then the rest of Mexican history would have been would have been glorious. Of course, it's you know it, it's impossible, it's it's a counterfactual, it's impossible to prove, but it becomes something of a, of a cornerstone of many conservative belief in Mexico. So when these conservatives lose the civil war, many of them flee to Europe. And the emperor of the French, Napoleon III, he happens to have a, a Spanish wife. Um, and it's through her, in fact, that these conservatives are able to get access to, to Napoleon III and pitch this project, which plays in perfectly with his pan-Latinist idea. So you can regenerate Mexico, it's the word the French always use. Um, so nation building, we might call it today, to create a strong, stable monarchy to, to confront the United States of America. And with this idea of monarchy at its heart. So you overturn the republic and you replace it with a monarch um, and you thereby create a viable, stable political entity. Absolutely right. Yeah. So um, this is not he's not doing this out of the goodness of his heart and altruism. Um, far from it. So he's he's Mexico in in the mid 19th century in Europe is seen as an El Dorado, as a land of fabulous riches, which if it were not for political instability would be a huge economic benefit um, to whichever country could marshal marshal its resources and exploit them. And so what he's being offered by these Mexican conservatives who come to him with this simple plan, which is with a few thousand troops you can turn up on the shores of Mexico. Benito Juarez and the liberals they may have won the civil war. 
but they are a radical minority oppressing the vast conservative Catholic majority of Mexico. Monarchy is immensely popular. So we will do all of the hard work for you, the Mexican conservatives argue. And in return, you will get all of the benefits of colonialism at a fraction of the cost. Because remember, at this, this, is, at this time, France has some 60 to 80,000 troops tied down in Algeria, fighting brutal colonial wars, um, and has been trying to pacify the euphemism the French always use um, in these situations, Algeria, for over 30 years, and for almost next to nothing in terms of the economic return. So this is, this is empire on the cheap. It's glory on the cheap as well. Remember, we're dealing with the nephew of the original Napoleon. Uh, so the kind of military conquest and, and glory is very much um, close to his heart. And it seems an offer that's too good to be true. And that's in mm -hmm. part because it is too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> Right. We, we, you would think as a, a role as important as, as Emperor of Mexico, there would be a fair amount of due diligence um, uh, and um, a careful sifting of candidates. And in fact, it, it, it's, it's rather simple. It's, um, it's who it, it, the person performing this role, um, they need to tick a few boxes. One, they need to be Catholic. So that rules out you know, a, a, a huge amount of, of the European royalty. Um, and secondly, they need to be available. Um, and willing to undertake this task. And, and in, in, in that, then Maximilian is the perfect candidate because he's the younger brother of Franz Joseph. He's a Habsburg as well. And of course, it was under the Habsburgs in the 16th century that, that Mexico is first conquered. So there's a very distant link to, to Mexico as well, which helps. But it's the fact that um, he's known to be ambitious. He's known to be jealous of his brother, Franz Joseph, who's the man who becomes emperor of Austria. Maximilian believes that he is destined for greatness uh, and for glory, and that if he were to rule, he would be much better than his, his brother, who he's um, on very, very cold terms with in Austria. Um, and so in, in that sense, he's the perfect candidate, because as I say, he's Catholic, he's available, and you have the Habsburg link to Mexico. So Napoleon III, um, through informal channels initially, and then, and then by writing to him, asks if he'd be interested, and Maximilian seizes on this opportunity to fulfill what he sees as his Habsburg destiny. And so, so he's, he's Maximilian, he's, um, he's very much a, a dreamer um, and you know, dreaming of, of Habsburg glory and how he would rule his empire. Um, but he's not without intelligence and he realizes this is gonna be a difficult undertaking. So although he's absolutely thrilled to be asked um, both by the Mexican conservatives who are in touch with him and go to meet him at Miramar, his incredible um, goth, neo-Gothic fairy tale castle he's constructed for himself. Uh, and Napoleon III, who also um, offer, offers him this, this in what is still an imaginary crown, he, He's, as I say, he's intoxicated with the idea, but he places two conditions on it. The first is it must be backed not just by France, but also by Britain. And the second, because Maximilian sees himself as a, as a modern and liberal, enlightened individual, is that the Mexican people must call him um, to, to the throne. So it must be based on some kind of democratic foundation. And without those two conditions being met, he won't accept the crown. So he accepts it conditionally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Colotta is, is, is key um, to, to the story and also to why Maximilian accepts the crown. Um, so she's the daughter of the King of Belgium, Leopold. Um, on her mother's side, she's the daughter of Louis-Philippe, who was, who was um, King of the French and was overthrown in the 1848 revolutions. So she has impeccable um, royal, royal lineage, although not as impeccable as the Habsburgs. And within the Habsburg court, she was looked down upon for being a mere Belgian princess, which if if you're as um, illustrious as the Habsburgs, the Belgian princess is, you know, um, is hardly worth anything. So she never really found much welcome within in, in the Habsburg court and, and the Habsburg world. But she's also fiercely ambitious um, for herself and for her husband. And while, as I say, he's someone who's a, who's a dreamer, she has practical intelligence, steel and determination. And she is as convinced, probably even more convinced of Maximilian's talents and his destiny to rule. So she is constantly pushing him 
And in fact, she later writes to, 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 you know, to stay in Europe at this wonderful castle that Maximilian built overlooking the Adriatic Miramar, they would have been staring out to sea uh, and dying of boredom uh, until they reached old age, which if your partner um, tells you that your life together is going to be infinitely tedious, you, you might start making other plans. So she is very much pushing Maximilian to accept this opportunity. Right. Yeah. So Napoleon III, he's just he's one of the great cons conspirators. He'd grown up um, conspiring and trying to overthrow various French governments um, because he had another man who believed in his own destiny that he would one day be French emperor. And he realizes his dream, but he never loses that 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 kind of modus operandi, that way of doing things, which is back channels, smoke field studies, conspiracies, sp spinning different information and misinformation, being very. Um, how can we say this euphemistically, um, economical with the truth. So the, the reason for the intervention is, as you say, it's tripartite. It's Britain, France and Spain in 1861 because Benito Juarez suspends foreign debt payment. The, the government is bankrupt after years of, of conflict uh, and, and the terrible state of the economy. So he asks for a moratorium on, on debt to the European powers. Now, in the mid 19th century, if you want the Royal Navy um, to turn up on, on your doorstep um, in the you know, the equivalent of an instant, you stop paying debt to Britain. And so there's initially, this is just a debt collecting um, um, expedition, the, the type of which the Royal Navy and the other European powers have uh, very, very often undertaken. But Napoleon III wants to hijack it and turn it into something much bigger, regime change. Now, as soon as, as Britain and indeed Spain discover that the plan is to overturn the legitimate government of Mexico and replace it with an empire, they don't want anything to do with it. Um, but Napoleon III keeps spinning this to, to Maximilian um, and misdirecting him and telling him that although Britain are publicly denying to, that they will have any role within it, they're just saying that for public opinion. They can't come out and say it. Explains that Britain works differently. It's a parliamentary democracy. There's freedom of the press. They, you know, they, they have to operate it's in secrecy. So they say one thing when they mean another. That's a complete lie that the British have absolutely no interest um, in taking part in this and guaranteeing the empire, as in nor, nor do the Spanish either. Um, once they realise just how, how um, kind of grand Napoleon III's schemes are. So when the, 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 the forces, in fact, under General Prim, the Spanish, um, land in Mexico and begin negotiations with Benito Juarez's government, they quickly decide to withdraw once they realise that the French troops uh, are determined to march inland and try and defeat the government of, of Benito Juarez. So the initial the initial intervention is is the three powers, Britain, France and Spain. But within months, Spain and Britain have washed their hands of the affair. Right. So this is yeah. So this is the very complex diplomacy that's going on on the ground in Mexico between the, with the three powers, their representatives of the Prime is, is the Spanish. Um, and they sign a treaty with the government of Benito Juarez, which essentially recognizes the, the Benito Juarez as the legitimate government of Mexico. Um, now, of course, this is a disaster for, for Napoleon III because his whole plan rests upon on, on the premise, the false premise, that, that uh, Benito Juarez's government is, is illegitimate. And um, in fact, the, you know, the government that he is going to create it will be the legitimate one. So he's furious. Um, the British and the, uh, and the Spanish are, are happy with this treaty because it essentially says that, that, that they, you know, repayments will eventually re-begin and um, there's you know, further negotiations. So in a sense, they've achieved what they came to achieve. Um, and as I said, Napoleon III, he's not a man who's too worried about, about the treaties that his representative signed. So although they have signed this treaty, recognised Benito Juarez's government as legitimate, um, they, they, they immediately break the terms of the treaty. The, one of the, the, the terms of the treaty were that French soldiers could not go beyond a certain um, distance into the interior of Mexico. And um, Napoleon III orders that his troops do begin to march on Mexico City. And of course, it, it, by this point, the Spanish and the British are horrified and have no intention of, of, of getting involved in a war in Mexico, are, are, are re-embarking their troops to, to send, send them back home. So the French troops, they are 
only there are only six thousand of them, um, and that's that's partially because Napoleon III is, is extremely confident. He's confident because he thinks that the Mexican um, conservatives will, it, will assist him. They will have allies on the ground. It's also, um, it's, a, it's half the number of troops that the US used when they invaded Mexico. So although 6,000 doesn't sound that many, it's, um, it was, it, it was, you know, 12,000 was enough to get to Mexico City for the United States of America. Napoleon III thinks that with the, with the help of the Mexican conservatives, this should be able to do the job. And of course, you've got to remember that this is the French army. They are marching under the imperial eagle um, of, of the Bonapartist um, in the kind of uh, legend and history. So they see themselves as the greatest army in the world. Um, and not without some reason, of course, because they defeated Russia in the Crimean War. Uh, they defeated the Austrians in 1859. Many of them are battle hardened veterans from warfare in Algeria. They are well trained, they are well equipped, and they think that the Mexican army um, will crumble. Um, at the first serious engagement. So they march into the interior and they march um, to the city of Puebla, which is the second city of Mexico and the gateway to Mexico City itself. And the commander in chief is supremely confident. Um, he doesn't have the time or the numbers for a long siege, so he decides on a frontal assault, expecting the, the Mexican army to crumble um, at the first sight of the, the, you know, this, this assault. However, um, wave after wave of French infantry are cut down as they assault the city by the heroic this resistance of the Mexican army, which far from crumbling at the sides of the French have in fact rallied around the legitimate president of Benito Juarez. And so this is a seminal moment which goes down in history as Cinco de Mayo, um, the 5th of May, as you say, 1862. And the French army is defeated outside the walls of Puebla and forced into a humiliating retreat. Well, it's it's fair to say that that, that, that it's that it's 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 complex. Um, it's in it, and obviously it's difficult to gauge because we're not we don't have opinion polls. But the uh, it's similar to so many foreign interventions. Um, there there is support for the conservatives uh, amongst many Mexicans. They've been they've they were able to sustain themselves in, in in the civil war. They have a political party. They you know they do well in. In elections when there have been elections uh, but it would be fair to say they are not as popular as Benito Juarez particularly when a foreign army turns up um, and they are seen to be betraying the patriot betraying the, the country uh, and so once it becomes a question of, of foreign invasion versus Benito Juarez most of them of the of, of the of the Mexican people um, or certainly who are politically engaged do rally behind Benito Juarez but that's not to say there isn't a significant constituency within Mexico that stay loyal to the conservatives and do eventually get behind the Mexican Empire but at the point at which the French army is invading Mexico there is there is you know there's demonstrably very little popular support whatsoever for that except for the very uh, die-hard conservatives who've concocted the plan in the first place. Yeah, so it's a long time after the initial um, offer comes through to Maximilian, it's actually in October 1861. The French send reinforcements, uh, they send 30,000 troops to Mexico. By 1863, they've taken Puebla, and by the summer of 1863, they've entered Mexico City and Benito Juarez. Most of the Mexican army was 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 captured um, the, the, a year after the, the first battle of Puebla in, in a siege. So Benito Juarez no longer has the forces to defend the capital. He decides to retreat, retreat northwards, doesn't surrender crucially, um, but he's just gone into retreat. The French take over the capital, occupy it. Come up with a constitution and a document. It's not a constitution, not even a constitution. You know, various documents which claim to be in the name of the Mexican people and offer the throne to Maximilian. He doesn't arrive in Mexico until a year after that. Not until the twenty eighth of May does the the Emperor um, of Mexico arrive um, and see his kingdom for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. So Maximilian, he's a key 
key character trait of his is that he vacillates, he procrastinates, he's indecisive. And the the, the closer he got to the reality of becoming emperor, the more he um, became terrified by by the prospect. And in, in part, it's because of this treaty, um, which is a very unequal treaty. And, and at its simplest, we might today think of it as a leveraged buyout. The cost of the French army occupying Mexico is going to go on to the people of Mexico themselves and, uh, and, and the treasury of Maximilian. The treaty stipulates that Maximilian has to meet monthly payments to, for the upkeep of the French army. If he doesn't, he'll be in breach of treaty and therefore Napoleon III can withdraw his troops. Now, the whole reason Spain, Britain and France intervened in the first place is because Mexico is bankrupt. So this is going to put huge pressure on the finances of Mexico um, and, and Maximilian's empire, which are already in a perilous state. Uh, and not only that, the only way that they can initially be met is by raising a loan. An enormous loan is raised on the money markets of Paris and, and indeed London, in fact. So it's um, it's all, it's almost a pyramid scheme of conquest of which um, Napoleon III is sitting at the top and underneath him, Maximilian precariously trying to maintain his power with very few resources in order to pacify the country, which is still in civil war. Mexico. Well, the, the glacial, I think, is probably the best word to describe it. So Maximilian and Carlotta, they, are, they arrive on board the, um, the Austrian frigate Navarra, 28th of May, 1864. And as it sails into the port of Veracruz on the Atlantic coast, the principal port of Mexico, they scan anxiously the horizon, looking out towards the docks, and they're almost deserted. There's just a few workers unloading small boats, and the kind of thing you'd expect to see um, at any working docks, but none of the waving crowds, flags, cheering that you would expect for such a momentous occasion. Um, and so they're, they're absolutely um, terrified by this lack of, of, of popular support. Now, there's, there's two reasons for that. Um, one is that um, Veracruz was the seat of Benito Juarez during the, the civil war that precedes all of this, um, and so is quite a strong liberal um, area. Uh, but secondly, and I sympathise with this slightly because I'm terrible at administration myself, the welcome committee had got the wrong day. By the time they realise that the royal couple have arrived and they're able to get a, you know, a few people um, down, down onto the dock, it's too late for them to disembark. Uh, and so they, they row out to, to, to the ship and talk to Maximilian Carlotta and explain to them that they won't be able to uh, come actually land in Mexico until the next day. And they're rowed in the, in sort of the, the twilight of the dawn into Veracruz. And of course, it's 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. Uh, the streets are deserted and they have um in, in veracruz they have in london we have pigeons in veracruz they have this sort of type of carrion bird it's not a bit like a vulture uh, and as they are driving driven through the, the deserted streets of mexico city the birds are, are circling overhead so it is uh, an absolutely terrible um first impression of mexico and as i say maximilian is he cries all the time in fact he cries when he accepted the crown and fell into a deep depression for about four days which delayed their departure carlotta on the other hand she's made of stronger stuff and she's absolutely delighted but even carlotta um she, she later wrote that she nearly didn't but nearly shed a tear when she reached veracruz so it's absolutely disastrous first impression Well, they, they are absolutely horrified. They are absolutely horrified because the, they have called over um, European royalty in a Habsburg, no less, precisely because they want to overturn the secular reforms of Benito Juarez, which they see as impious, as atheistic um, and dangerous. And the key one here is, in fact, the sale of church property. In the 1850s, the Mexican liberals had, had um, nationalized church property and sold it off to private buyers, which is a classic liberal policy. And, and it's very similar things happened under the French Revolution. As I say, conservatives see this as, as an impious assault on all that is good and holy. The first thing they expect um, Maximilian to do is overturn this and a series of other secular reforms. And, but as you say, Maximilian, he sees himself as a liberal, modern, enlightened ruler. His examples are his father-in-law, Leopold the, um, the First of Belgium, who rules a, a constitutional monarchy. Britain is another influence, and to some extent France under Napoleon III. Um, 
and so um, he he tries and he tries to win over um, you know, Far Easters people who who fought or supported Benito Juarez by pitching himself as 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 a liberal and as liberal as, as Benito Juarez. And this goes to the extreme of dressing in Mexican national costume, um, which is a sort of classic cowboy um, look in some respects, with a sort of red bandana and a sombrero. And the Mexican conservatives are horrified because what they wanted when they called over Maximilian was was a reactionary policies to support the Catholic Church, but also all of the, the the grandeur and the glamour of European monarchy. They didn't want someone who's dressing like a cowboy, uh, who's, who's, who's confirming all of the policies that they have been fighting against for you know at least 10 years. So they are so distraught by um, Maximilian's um, various different attempts to appeal to liberals that they all but withdraw their, their active support for his regime. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, it's a it's a really good question because the only reason that this has happened in the first place is because of course there is another civil war north of the border, and that's the American Civil War. Without that, the United States of America would have in, in, it would have upheld the Monroe Doctrine, and this is a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy since 1823. No European power can intervene in the Americas, um, and especially not in the Republican system of government. So the the Americas will is. It will be Republican and will not be uh, a, a, a prey to European um, ventures such as this. With the Civil War and the, the Union itself um, torn in two and its existence um, very much in the balance, Washington and under um, the, the capital, sorry, Washington as in the capital, under Abraham Lincoln, they cannot afford to upset um, France, which of course they would do if they were to take any serious action. So they express their disapproval, Congress passes resolutions, etc. But nothing concrete because the worst case scenario, France gets involved in the US Civil War or even recognizing the Confederacy, um, which would be an absolute disaster. So although the United States of America is opposed to the intervention, it is the absolute nightmare of US um, politicians for the last 50 years because you have Catholics, you have Bonapartists, you have Habsburgs. I mean, this is all of the sort of uh, the toxic mix of the old world as they would see it turning up on the doorstep of the United States of America. But there's nothing that they can do until the Civil War ends. She absolutely did, yeah. So as a Maximilian, the other thing that we should say about him, he was um, something of a dilettante. He really enjoyed um, natural science. And so Alexander von Humboldt was, was a great hero of his, who, of course, went to Mexico in the, at the beginning of the 19th century. And um, Maximilian, in he, his critics and his opponents called him a royal tourist because he was constantly traveling around his kingdom. Um, he had a fascination um, with butterflies, with sort of rare fauna, um, you know, cataloging various different species of flowers, trees, etc. So Mexico was in that sense a paradise for him. But it meant that he was away from Mexico City quite a lot. And while he was away, Carlos acted as regent. Uh, unlike Maximilian, she was incredibly decisive. She was very, she was on top of her brief. She would read the notes before holding cabinet meetings. Maximilian would hold these meetings and they would just be discuss for discussion forums and, and more often than not, they would push any decision um, down the road to, you know, set up a committee, look at it for six months, report back. She would come in, she would have her decision already arrived at and she would explain to the ministers what it was and how they should do it. So she was much more decisive. She also understood the military situation much better than uh, Maximilian did and she realised that Maximilian, um, he created an Academy of Arts and Sciences. He, he implemented incredibly laudable reforms in education and things like this, but they were never really enacted because he never controlled Mexico sufficiently to do so. And she would constantly urging him and indeed the French generals who were, um, who were making up the bulk of, of the fighting force, that the first thing to do is to crush Benito Juarez, who has never surrendered, but is fighting on. Um, and then one can rule as, a, as, as an enlightened um, liberal. But before then, the most important thing is to crush the resistance. So what I understand from what you're saying is that one thing is the real situation of Mexico. Another thing was the idea that Maximilian has in his head of Mexico, right? 
Oh yeah, completely. Um, he, he's he, Maximilian is happiest when he's governing his paper his paper empire, um, and he's he's dreaming up schemes of taking over Guatemala, of, of making marriage alliances with the emperors of of, uh, of Brazil, uh, and all of these grand you know, schemes which have no chance of ever um, coming into reality because the, what's going on in Mexico is a brutal civil war, um, which is yet to be won. The imperial authority is weak, even in areas that they do control, and everything still needs to be consolidated. And after the military situation, what needs to be organized is the finances. So rather than focusing on, as I say, on education or, um, um, of course, museums and things like that, which is his preferred method of, of, of governing and what he would like to put his attention on, the really important matters of state are drifting um, and in towards a, a disastrous outcome. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, so the, the the imperialists as the supporters of Maximilian are known, uh, and the French army they do very they do well initially, uh, certainly territorially, and um, they uh, do push the Far East uh, guerrilla forces further and further back, both north and, and south. Um, but the key turning point is 1865, uh, and there's two there's two, well there's three reasons for that. Um, one is of course just the the heroic resistance of Benito Juarez, um, who against the advice of even his own uh, politicians. Um, continues to fight on. Many of them said that he should surrender and come to a, an arrangement with the Imperial Easters. So he's continuing the resistance, but what tips it in his balance is the end of the US Civil War. What this means is now the United States of America can lift an arms embargo that they, they had prohibited the sale of weapons across the border um, so as not to an antagonize the French during their own civil war. That's lifted, weapons flood to the Far East as they're able to resupply. Also, in fact, volunteers as well, and quite a few um, US citizens go across to volunteer to fight for the name of, of republicanism in, in Mexico. Uh, and perhaps more important than both of those things was money. They're able to get loans from, um, uh, from, from across the border which they can, um, as I say, resupply their forces. So that's crucial. From Maximilian's point of view, the third, the third thing that happens that, that, um, that year is the finances now are in such a, um, a, a mess that Maximilian can no longer meet those monthly payments, which he has to in order to keep the French army in Mexico. At the same time, Washington puts pressure on Napoleon III and by the end of the year essentially issues an ultimatum, which is if you don't get your French troops out of Mexico, the United States of America will invade uh, and get them out for you. So that would be war with the United States. Now, Louis Napoleon, he doesn't like the United States. He's, he does subscribe to the philosophy of Pan-Latinism, but there's absolutely no way he's taking France to war against the United States of America. So the fact that Maximilian can no longer meet these payments is the perfect excuse for him to announce the withdrawal of his troops. Maximilian had written him a letter saying, uh, unfortunately, the treasury in the situation that it is, I cannot make the payments. But don't worry, you know, I'm, I'm good for it. We're friends, essentially. Um, uh, and Napoleon says, no, I'm, I'm putting the plug. And in fact, he does so by announcing it to the French corps legislative, the, the French parliament, before he even informs Maximilian. So it's a fait accompli. Um, it's irreversible, um, at least in Napoleon III's mind. He announces the French troops are, are coming home. Now, it's not, it's not an immediate withdrawal. It's which be familiar to anyone who's who's followed the events in Afghanistan or Iraq recently in the 21st century. It's what's called a phase withdrawal. The French troops are going to come back, but they're not going to come back until the end of 1867. So there's uh, just under two years while French troops will still be in Mexico. And Napoleon III thinks that there is still a chance that Maximilian's empire can survive and consolidate in that time. Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, it's a great question. He should have done. He tried twice. Um, the first time he does so in a sort of fit of anger when he reads the Louis Napoleon's letter telling him that um, French troops are withdrawing. He says, fine, if you don't want me here, I'll abdicate. 
It's Carlotta who talks him round. She writes him a 10 page memorandum, which again, um, you get seeing this, this kind of advice from your partner, you may want to reconsider your actions. She calls him a coward, an idiot, um, that he has, he's not worthy of the name of Habsburg, which for Maximilian is probably the greatest insult you could give him. So she talks him into staying. Her plan is she will go back to Europe. She will convince Napoleon III to change his mind. Um, and if she arrives in August, um, 1866, Napoleon III, and I have some sympathy here, he tries to avoid this meeting, which would be very unpleasant for him, but she essentially says, I will break in to um, your palace and we will have this meeting. So he accepts. Carlos, she's done her homework, she's got two letters that Napoleon III wrote to Maximilian before he came um, to Mexico, in which Napoleon III had said, my support will never fail you, no matter what happens. Uh, and of course, his support has massively failed Maximilian. So Carlotta points this out to him. He reads the letter, Napoleon III, he breaks down in tears, but he doesn't change his mind. Um, he is taking his troops out. So Carlotta's plan has failed. She's got one trick up her sleeve. She's going to go and see the Pope in Rome. Um, because as we'd said earlier, the conservatives have withdrawn their support for Maximilian because of his liberal policies. What Carlotta wants is a concordat with the papacy, whereby the Pope will essentially give his stamp of approval to the secular reforms, thereby, even though Mexican Catholics hate them, they will have to come back on board because they've been sanctified by the Pope. Instead of um, discussing church-state relations, though, when she goes to the Vatican um, for a second meeting with the Pope, she breaks down in tears, sobbing, uncontrollable um, screams, and she says to the Pope and anyone who listened that Napoleon III is trying to assassinate her, that she ha that he has infiltrated her entourage, uh, and that they are trying to murder her. Now this is. Napoleon III is many things. He's not a murderer. She has completely lost her mind uh, and, in fact, never recovers and never well enough to return to Mexico. So, second time Maximilian abdicates is when he hears the news that his wife is terribly sick uh, and he decides that he'll return to Europe and that he'll go to, go to look after her. He packs everything up. He sends back his archive to Europe, um, which is in Vienna to, to this day, uh, and all kinds of furniture and so on are sent. M many of his advisors have already gone to Europe. But he's talked out of it, and this time he's talked out of it by his conservative allies, who tell him that now that the French are withdrawing, the stigma of foreign intervention will no longer be on the imperial East Accords, and the people of Mexico will rally behind him once he starts enacting conservative policies. Um, that was, they argued, the mistake all along. There'll be tens of thousands of men, um, tens of millions of pesos, and you know the fortunes of the empire will miraculously revive, uh, and Maximilian... Um, is convinced by this and also I think absolutely terrified by the prospect of going back to Europe as a humiliated failed emperor. incredibly incredibly dramatic so the the plan is to, is to march to a town to the northwest of mexico city Querétaro, which is um which where some the remnants of the imperial easter army and it's not it's you know a few thousand men are, are, are holding out um and maximilian will march with the relief force the best generals of the empire will unite together and they will roll back the the far easter advance um he marches out with only 1500 men not the tens of thousands and 50,000 pesos not the tens of billions so you can see by this point to call it an empire is almost comic um Maximilian is incredibly brave under fire, but he'd never led an army. He'd, he'd served in the Navy. Navy. Um, and it's an extraordinary moment as he's marching this relief force um, um, outside of Mexico, Mexico City, and they come under fire. And he later writes that he saw the most beautiful butterflies um, in the distance as the bullets were whistling past him. So you can see what sort of man you're dealing with, not necessarily the greatest military commander. Um, long story short, he, he, he walks into a trap um, the town is put under siege. It's a terrible place for a siege. It's surrounded on three sides by, by hills. The Juaristas um, occupy the high ground because Maximilian's men um, are insufficient to do so. He holds out for just over two months, um, but eventually um, he is uh, betrayed and Juarista forces um, come in and despite a, a, a semi-heroic last stand, he's captured. You're right. There's then he's court-martialed. Now he's 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 not recognised as head of state by Benito Juarez, of course. Benito Juarez is, is the president, um, 
and he's the, it's political theatre. It's held in an actual theatre, the trial, the court martial, and the theatre is named after Augustin de Itabide. So anyone who has been paying attention will remember that is the name of the first emperor of Mexico who was executed. Um, they take a day and a half to come to their deliberation. This is not a serious trial, um, and he is found guilty um, of, 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 of treason and, and caught arms in hand. So he's sentenced to death and, 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 and to execution. And that takes place on the 19th of June, very famously immortalized in the painting of Edouard Manet, the French artist, the executioner of Maximilian. And he's executed alongside two of his most loyal conservative generals, to, uh, Thomas Mejier and uh, Miguel Miramon. Um, I, on, um, well, in fact, not I, on, in the painting, uh, he's in the middle, but in reality, he's executed um, to the right of the firing squad, if that makes sense. So it's an incredibly ignominious end for someone who was born in the imperial splendor of Schönbrunn in um, Palace in, in, in Vienna, you know, the, sort of, um, the Versailles of, 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 of Austria, if you will, and ends up executed on a dusty hilltop overlooking a provincial Mexican town. Mm-hmm.